Hey everybody, this is Darren Van Dam, and you are watching Flick Connection, the show that connects you with the best movies on streaming, and today we're going to be talking about all the best new releases currently included with HBO Max. So HBO Max is one of my favorite streaming services for movies just because they have a lot of really great stuff, old stuff, new stuff, hidden gems, but today we're going to be talking about 20 of the best new release movies currently included with HBO Max. For the most part, this is going to be movies from 2021 and 2022. I did include a couple of movies technically released in 2020, but they didn't really see a wider audience until 2021, so these are all brand spanking new movies, and yes, the Batman is now included with HBO Max, and it fits into this ranked list somewhere. This video is sponsored by Magic Spoon, and I'll be telling you more about them later in the video, but let's go ahead and start with my number 20 pick, Freaky. How weird is it that I kind of feel like kissing you right now? Technically, you'd be kissing a mass murderer with yellow teeth. So this one was technically released in 2020 and didn't really see much of an audience because, you know, there was a global pandemic going on. But this is a fun movie where Vince Vaughn actually plays a serial killer whose body becomes inhabited by a teenage girl. So this is essentially the setup from Freaky Friday, but instead of a mother and daughter, it is a teenage girl and serial killer. What's fun about Freaky is you essentially get Vince Vaughn pretending to be a teenager for the bulk of the movie. And as silly as that sounds, it is, but he makes it work. It continues to be entertaining. It has a little bit in common with that Rob Schneider movie, The Hot Chick, but instead of only that joke, you also get a horror movie because there's a teenage girl whose body is inhabited by this serial killer, so she's going around hacking people apart, and it's bloody, but never too gross or gory because this is a horror comedy, but it's also not a knee slapper. It's got a nice little blend of both. If you like the concept for this one, it's well worth watching. All right, I've only got two more horror movies on the list and they just happen to be towards the back because they were weaker efforts over the last year or so, but I actually think Malignant from James Wan is an underrated movie and a misunderstood one. I will say this is not a strong recommendation for me. There's a lot a lot of weird stuff going on in this movie, which is why I recommend it. So you don't wanna go into this one expecting the same thing you normally get from James Wan, because you are definitely not gonna get it. This actually has a lot more in common with cult classics like Basket Case. So if you're a fan of those movies, Malignant is one of the cooler things to come along in a while. However, if you're not tapped into that already, Malignant is certainly gonna be one of the weirder things to come along in a while. I've also got a couple of documentaries on this list, and my next pick is called Beanie Mania, and it's actually an HBO Max original. Let me tell you a story about a tiny tie since he created these bees that make me hot. Beanie rat. It's a beanie wrap, it's a beanie wrap. Now I'm sure everyone watching remembers Beanie Babies. They were a huge craze. At least if you're 30 or older, you remember what Beanie Mania was. People went nuts for these things. This is not a hard-hitting crime documentary or anything like that, but it does document the rise and fall of Beanie Babies and some of the corruption that went on in the business that ultimately led to its collapse. It does make for an interesting watch, but it is fairly shallow as well. I mean, it's a documentary about Beanie Babies, but it is well done. All right, I got another horror movie on this list, and then only one more that's further up towards the top spot on this list, but I actually liked Halloween Kills. Now, I really enjoyed the first Halloween, the one directed by David Gordon Green, written by Danny McBride. I thought they did a good job with this 30 years later follow-up to Halloween. Liked it, didn't love it, and Halloween Kills got some very mixed reviews, but I thought it was a solid effort. So the filmmaking style here, you know, there's really nothing new happening because it is filmed in a way to sync up with the original Halloween and it does do that. So the look matches the original movie, the score matches the original movie, it's new, but half of it was composed by John Carpenter. So 
It's different. It's got a new sound to it, but it still feels like Halloween. Story-wise, I actually liked some of the things that they did with the story. It's a little confusing at times, but then it all comes together and it works. Now, I do think that they dropped the ball in some places. It does go into that direction where Michael Myers just can't be killed. At the very least, they try to explain it a little bit, and even though I don't think Halloween Kills ultimately worked, it's not totally cohesive, there's a lot of interesting ideas that come to life in this movie, including this entire town developing mob mentality. I thought that was actually conveyed pretty well, and it actually served the story pretty well. And they added some new characters that I thought were great, like Anthony Michael Hall, and some comedy actors that I thought did a great job with the Big John and Little John characters. So there's stuff I liked about Halloween Kills, I just ultimately didn't love the entire thing. Something I've been enjoying thoroughly, though, is today's sponsor, Magic Spoon. So sweet cereal and a healthy lifestyle have never really gone together at all until now because of Magic Spoon. This is an incredible cereal that not only tastes delicious and really scratches that sweet craving itch, Magic Spoon has zero grams of sugar, a whopping 13 grams of protein, and only four net carbs per serving, making this an incredibly high protein snack that is sugar-free, grain-free, and gluten-free. So if you're like me and you pack in a lot of protein into your diet, but you still get cravings from time to time, Magic Spoon is an excellent thing to keep in your cabinet. And right now when my viewers use the link in the description or just go to magicspoon.com slash flick, you're gonna save $5 off your first order with Magic Spoon. In the last video, they sponsored. I said I like the chocolate flavor, the maple waffle, the oatmeal cookie, which is true. I like all of those, but I had not opened the frosted flavor yet when I did that ad because this box looks so cool. I wanted to save it. Um, this is my second box because I devoured the first one immediately. This stuff is amazing. I highly recommend getting the variety pack so you can try a few different things, but make sure you include the frosted one in that pack. Trust me. And again, just go to that link in the description or go to magicspoon.com slash flick and you're gonna save five dollars off your first order it's gonna be your new favorite snack you're welcome but let's go ahead and move on and try to find one of your new favorite movies now I know this one got mixed reviews but believe it or not I actually really enjoyed Mortal Kombat now this is actually coming from someone who plays the game quite a bit even to this day but that does not really like the original movie yeah I remember when we were kids it seemed cool but it is not a very good movie and the new one I would also say is not a very good movie. However, there's a lot of great moments in it and it is a fun watch. If you really think about it, we do not get too many big budget action movies like this that are rated R, that have a hard R rating. Obviously things like Deadpool come to mind, but for the most part, this art form was largely abandoned in the mid 90s in favor of PG-13 movies. This easily could have been PG-13. I think it would have been a total waste of time, but because it's got that hard R edge to it, it makes for a fun watch that's a little bit more elevated in terms of violence and adult content than you would normally get with this type of a movie, which is why I appreciated it more than I typically appreciate this type of movie. Speaking of those types of movies though, I actually included Zack Snyder's Justice League on this list. Now, I know I did a video on this movie where I called it turd polish, and I still agree with that statement. I think it is that because the first movie was a total turd, and this did improve upon it in some impressive ways. However, it's still kind of a stupid movie where Superman comes in and saves the day and kind of negates a lot of what happens in the movie. But the villain looks much more menacing than in the first one. It's got a harder edge. Some of the scenes that they added in actually elevate the movie and make it work much better. But it's still this kind of overlong thing that has a lot of flaws in its conception. But if nothing else, it is really stunning to look at, much more so than the original Justice League. Now my next pick is the newest release on this particular video. Not necessarily the newest thing to hit HBO Max, that one's coming up further up the list, but The Night House is actually a pretty decent horror flick. Now, I will tell you, especially for those of you that have seen it already, I am judging this based on it being a streaming service original movie. For the most part, the horror movies that Netflix turns out have been pretty crappy. And that's me being nice about it. I mean, there's a couple of exceptions, but they're mostly 
pretty terrible. The Night House, though, is fairly exceptional, especially for one that went straight to streaming. I don't think this movie would have killed in the movie theaters, but I do think it would have been pretty good, and I personally wouldn't have been that let down. I do think the movie asks a lot more questions than it answers, but it is an interesting ride, and there's some very interesting visuals along the way. I also happen to be a fan of Rebecca Hall, so I didn't mind kind of just spending an hour and 45 minutes with her, but this is kind of a dark, grim movie. I know that goes without saying with it being a horror movie, but it starts off with the death of a husband, so it is a downer of a flick, but if nothing else, it does go into some very interesting directions. All right, my next pick is actually one that disappointed me this past year, but I've still got it ranked in the middle of this list because I still love everyone in it, and I'm a fan of Steven Soderbergh's direction. But No Sudden Move was actually a pretty highly anticipated movie. Now, they actually shot this in Detroit during COVID, and it's the first time Steven Soderbergh was doing another movie there with Don Cheadle. You may remember one of his earlier movies, Out of Sight, also took place there with Don Cheadle. So it was interesting to see him return. I I like the time period. It was interesting to go on a crime caper during this time period with Don Cheadle and Benicio Del Toro. However, the pacing and the tone and everything of this movie felt like it was missing something kind of major. That said though, you've still got amazing performances and really, if nothing else, some really great scenes. There's a couple of scenes in this movie that really stand out on their own and are much better than the movie is as a whole. That said though, if you like the people involved, you like crime capers, this one's pretty accessible, it's just not mind-blowing. Okay, my next pick on this list is technically not a movie. Singer-songwriter Halsey released her latest album on HBO Max with this incredible movie-esque type thing. Essentially, what you've got here is her new album in chronological order, yet they filmed each song as a music video in this continuous narrative that takes place during this like medieval era Moments of this thing look like it belongs in Game of Thrones. Other moments look even better than that. It's pretty hot as well. There's a fair amount of sex and nudity in it. You may not enjoy the music. I happen to like her music and thought the way that this thing was put together was pretty exceptional, especially for something like this. I wish musicians were doing things like this a little more often because this thing is pretty badass. I recommend maybe giving it the first two tracks. If you're not into it by then, maybe it's not for you, but if you want to watch something different, this could be a great way to go. All right, and then another documentary on this list, which also is incredibly new, Tony Hawk Until the Wheels Fall Off. Now this is actually from the Duplass brothers who do a ton of documentary work, really great stuff like Wild Wild Country. And what's great about this Tony Hawk documentary is if you're a fan of his in any way, you absolutely need to see this, it is really well done. But even if you're not, even if you don't care anything about Tony Hawk or skateboarding, this is a really great documentary about someone who is at the top of their game. You know, the pinnacle of their field and how they got there, the journey and all the things that happened along the way, the hard work, the chance things that have to happen along the way. I think it's an important thing to see. And unfortunately, it is rated TVMA. There's some pretty harsh language in it at times, even though it's not pervasive, because I would like to watch this with my six-year-old. However, I may just put this one in my back pocket when he's a little bit older. I think this could be a really important thing for him to see at a young age. But my next pick is not only something I can watch with him, it's something I know he thoroughly enjoys at the ripe age of six, Ron's Gone Wrong. I am Barney's Bebot. Will you come to my secret shed and like him? Uh, no, no. I think I laughed out loud more during this movie than anything else this past year because a lot of the coming of age humor in this movie is really going to speak to adults. It's things you recognize now that you didn't know when you were a kid, but at the same time, it takes place in this future where everyone has these unique little robots and the main character comes from a poorer family that can't afford one and he kind of gets stuck with a broken one that ends up becoming his best friend. The beats and paces in this movie are all familiar. It feels like something I've seen before with an added touch. There's an interesting sense of humor here that feels different than Pixar's sense of humor. And then the story's got a little bit more tooth to it than you typically get with these family-friendly movies. So this is one I've watched a couple of times this year with my kids and we've all had a blast. 
Okay, one to definitely not watch with the kids in the room is Shiva Baby. Now, this actually came out in 2020, but only really started gaining an audience in 2021, and I liked it enough to include it at this spot on the list. Now, listen closely because this is definitely not one for everybody. This is about a Jewish college girl at a crowded funeral service known as a Shiva, or I've heard Shiva more often than Shiva, but she runs into her sugar daddy there. And what you need to know about this movie is it all takes place at this funeral service and it turns into some pressure cooker situations. It's very, very well done. This is gonna appeal to the indie, art film crowd, but it's just so well composed. It is from a writer director, which I typically prefer with these types of movies because you get kind of the one voice coming through, but you've also got some really incredible performances. Again, for a movie that exclusively takes place at a Jewish funeral service or any funeral service, Shiva Baby is surprisingly well paced and it does dabble with some pretty delicate themes and it does so in a really pretty exquisite way if you ask me. Longtime subscribers know I'm a big fan of Wes Anderson, particularly his early movies and his more recent movies. However, The French Dispatch is not one of my favorites. That said, it still is ranked pretty high here because it comes from such an incredible filmmaker. Now, don't misunderstand me. I did not just put this here on the list because I think Wes Anderson movies deserve it. No, this is a beautiful movie. I just have maybe five of his that I like better. So that's always a letdown for me. However, this is still a really cool anthology flick. Now, ultimately, I think that's what I didn't like about it. There's not enough time for Wes Anderson to really sink his chompers into one particular story. At the same time, though, I did enjoy this change of pace. You get these really interesting little performances from actors like Benicio Del Toro. And all the stories are interesting, but they kind of meander, and this movie does suffer from some of the things that I like the least about Wes Anderson movies, like the meandering stories. So if you're a fan of Wes Anderson, I highly recommend checking out this movie, but if you only like a couple of his movies, then The French Dispatch may not be the one for you. Now, one that I have talked about on HBO list here on the channel before is The Last Duel, and that's because I think it's one of the more underrated movies from last year. Now, I do know it got nominated for a bunch of awards during award season, but it came out quite a while ago and was largely overlooked, again, because of the pandemic, but it is excellent stuff. Now, this movie does misrepresent itself in the marketing a little bit, or at least some of the marketing. This is directed by Ridley Scott, who's famous for some great historical dramas like Gladiator and Kingdom of Heaven, and this movie is not one of those. Now, the movie is bookended by this battle between these two knights, but the real meat and potatoes of the movie is why they're fighting each other, and it's because there was a rape, or at least a alleged rape. And what's interesting about The Last Duel is it takes that assault, that event, and looks at it from multiple perspectives. So you do have to watch it multiple times, but you see it from the way other people are explaining it, and it makes for a really interesting watch, even if it's one I don't really care to watch again. Now another one that is hard to watch, but I could definitely see myself watching again, is Judas and the Black Messiah. Now this is one where I was interested in everyone involved. I like the actors, I like the director, but I wasn't particularly interested in the story. So I didn't watch it for the first few months, and man was I surprised at the amount of style in this movie. I feel like typically these historical dramas like this play it pretty safe. They try to represent the events and the people fairly accurately, and while they maybe did that here, they also piled on some style with a killer soundtrack, some interesting camera work, and I mean like right from the very beginning, the opening sequence just surprised me. This movie overall was much more compelling than I expected it to be. And I mean, the trailers make it look like it's fairly compelling, but it just was so much more elevated than I expected. And while I know this movie was well reviewed and a lot of people did like it, I do feel like a lot of people slept on it similarly to me, and you shouldn't. This movie is way better than you would expect. Now, another one that was way better than I could have expected was Free Guy, starring Ryan Reynolds. Now, the reason I've gushed about this movie a couple of times is because it fits into the same wheelhouse a lot of summer blockbusters do. Big budget special effects, it's really glossy, there's a lot of stuff exploding and colors and all of that. Yet normally those types of movies lean on all of that stuff I just mentioned like a crutch. And Free Guy does not. Free Guy actually has a really interesting, compelling story for this type of movie. 
it, it, I mean, it punches way above its weight. You also have Ryan Reynolds playing the main character who adds a degree of charm and wit that you don't get from many, if any, other actors. So that adds a layer. And it's not based on our franchise or anything. It's loosely, I guess, based on Grand Theft Auto and some other games like that. But it takes that and does something completely unique with it. And is also a really fun ride with lots of dazzling action. Speaking of dazzling action though, my next four picks all feature quite a bit of it. My next pick being Nobody starring Bob Odenkirk. I loved this movie. It came out in early 2021 and it was one of my favorite things I saw in the theater last year. This movie also features a really familiar premise in that Bob Odenkirk is this retired hitman essentially being pulled out of retirement to fight some bad guys again. Sounds simple enough, but the mere casting of Bob Odenkirk is what elevates this movie. If you don't know, Bob Odenkirk is a comedy legend and he was before he was Better Call Saul. His choice in this movie really makes for an interesting one. Not only because you would not expect him to be doing the things he's doing in this movie, but also because he trained like a beast in order to make it all look really authentic, which is kind of what's funny about it. I mean, even his wardrobe, they gave him this really kind of almost below average look. The guy can't even get the garbage cans out to the road on time, which speaking of, I think I just missed my garbage cans this morning. So he's average at best, maybe a little below average seemingly, and then essentially he's a retired John Wick. It works. I mean, there's some silly stuff with this movie, but all of the stunt work is top notch. I mean, it's, it's stunt people working at the top of their game, and it makes for a really entertaining watch. All right, you've been wondering when the Batman was gonna show up on the list and it gets the number three spot. Now, part of the reason it gets the number three spot is honestly, I don't know that anyone's ever going to be able to top The Dark Knight. I just rewatched it recently. It's a movie I probably watch once every other year or so, and it is absolutely brilliant. The Batman is just not gonna come close to it for most of you, but it still is a really exceptional Batman movie. So right off the bat, you can tell it's got the look of David Fincher's Seven. They almost lifted it, and I don't mind that for the most part. I love that movie, and seeing Batman in the same type of universe, I thought was really appropriate and really on brand for Batman. And to put it even more on brand, this is much more of a detective movie than it is like an action movie or a superhero movie, which is what Batman comics, I don't wanna say are all about, but that is a big feature and theme that you'll see in them. And I thought The Batman brought that to life pretty well. I also thought a lot of the performances were incredible. The top ones though being the villains, which is almost always the case with Batman movies. I thought Colin Farrell did an amazing job as the Penguin. A little side note, HBO Max is actually developing a series spinoff starring him as the Penguin in the makeup, and it's actually going to be directed by Matt Reeves, the same director as the Batman. So I'm definitely going to be checking that out. I also thought Paul Dano as the Riddler was just top notch, and I liked Pattinson as Batman. I just think other people in the movie were doing much better work than he was. I love the look of this one. It's much more epic than I expected it to be. I mean, it is long, it's almost three hours, but it fills that three hours pretty well. I will say the Batman is excellent, but I've got two movies on this list that I ranked higher. All right, my next pick might shock some of you, but you'll get over it. I put Dune at the number two spot, not the number one, mainly because it is an unfinished product. It is not a complete movie. I'm very much looking forward to seeing the sequel and seeing how everything gets tied together, but we're gonna have to wait a while. That said, Dune is not only a beautiful movie, but it is brilliantly, brilliantly orchestrated. Now, I could go on for about 30 minutes, but I'm gonna to try to be concise because what Denis Villeneuve did with this movie is he took an incredibly complicated book, one that was very, very difficult to translate to screen in the 80s. I mean, say what you will about the 80s version, it really struggles to tell the story and tell a lot of the details that you need to know in this completely new world. The new version, though, piles up information in a way that I'm not sure I've quite seen before. 
Meaning sometimes what someone says is different from what's on camera, yet the mixture of the two is actually informing you of things that are actually going on in this world. And what I think Denis did, aside from just filming a beautiful movie, is he did a great job at cherry picking the things we really need to know about the world of Dune and conveyed them in a very organic way. Everything feels pretty natural. There's a couple of scenes of exposition, but for the most part, you get little snippets of that. You're never just sitting listening to someone explaining how their universe works. It's all given to you in these little bite-sized pieces and it ultimately works as a final product. Even if the story itself isn't finished, the movie, I think, is glued together incredibly well. Okay, and after all of that, you must be thinking, what could possibly be better than some of those movies? Some of you might freak out at this, but I will say, I think what James Gunn did with the Suicide Squad was beyond brilliant. I cherish peace with all my heart. I don't care how many men, women, and children I need to kill to get it. I thought you were the crazy one. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've watched the first 15 minutes of this movie probably 10 times in the past year. I think it's one of the best 10 minutes of movie making to have been done since the beginning of this pandemic. It's funny, it's full of action, and it is one hell of a trick to play on the audience. Not only that, consider the fact that the original Suicide Squad was a total flop. Yeah, it probably made a little money, but fans, for the most part, hated it. I mean, like, vehemently hated it. Then James Gunn says, hold my beer. He decides to make a rated R one. He keeps some of the cast, he kills other ones off, and it just turns into this different animal. I think the inclusion of Idris Elba as Bloodsport was brilliant. There's a lot of great performances here, but he carries it really well. Say what you will about John Cena. The man is incredibly funny. I don't know, I didn't think he had it in him. I mean, I, he's been funny and stuff, but not in ways that cut like the Suicide Squad. I also thoroughly enjoyed the Peacemaker series. James Gunn just does a great job of, of hitting you over the head, doing things over the top in a way that's really fun. I mean, I thought the Suicide Squad was maybe the closest thing to a live action Rick and Morty movie. It's just incredibly funny, fun, and interesting. If you go through anything in this genre, it feels like you're watching the same thing over and over again. There are not many scenes in the Suicide Squad that I felt like I'd seen before. The movie surprised me a bunch in ways that were just, again, just incredibly fun to watch. So that is why I love that movie so much. And those are my picks for the top new releases included with HBO Max right now. Let me know what you've seen over the past year that you maybe think I missed. Who knows, maybe one of your recommendations will make it onto a future video. Thanks again to Magic Spoon for sponsoring another video. I actually do eat this stuff regularly and I love it. If you want more movie recommendations, go to darrenvandam.com. Links for all of this are in the description below. But I will keep making these videos as long as you keep watching them. Thanks for checking out this special HBO Max list, and you will see me on the next one.